want to understand the world we live in now. And there's no other way to understand the world that we live in now without understanding what it grew out of. All right? So when you talk about a young black man in Ferguson, Missouri, or in Baltimore, what is his worth? Well, when cotton is no longer king, and when the factories that folk used to work in were exploited are closed down, and when the homes that some people used to have to clean are themselves being foreclosed, all you got to do is call him a thug, and his value is nothing. You can kill him on the street. It's surplus population. So this is the world that we live in. And so for us to reclaim our full humanity, we have to understand that that stands by creating new systems of being with each other so that in the new system, the value of a human being is the full human value. Their value as a poet, a thinker, a lover, a carrier of the culture. That is what the value of a human being is. That's what we deserve back and need in order to reclaim our full humanity. So when I talk about repair and reparations, that's what I want. All right? And what do I want it for? I don't want it so we can spend it. I don't want another unit of consumption so we can all go out and buy the fancy... Li you know what? If they gave us a bunch of checks, Cadillac would come out with a brand new Liberation Cadillac. <laughs> it would have... It would have red, black, and green spinners on it that would keep on running. And, and it would only cost twice as much as their standard Cadillac. And they say, this is the Freedom Car. And Nike would have limited a red... Edition. Limited edition. Nike would have a Liberation shoe. Cost $350. You know what? Be a big bump up in the economy for somebody. And the con No, I'm not talking about consumption, but think about this. 40 acres and a mule was a production unit. It was not a consumption unit. So when Richard Simmons said, it ought to be 40 acres on a Bentley now, it's not a big, a mule can grow its own corn and feed itself. A Bentley ain't never fed itself or you or anybody else in your neighborhood, right? So we're talking about enabling people's capacity to be productive. <laughs> Through the development stuff. That's the repair I want to see. So when I think about a reparations loan fund, that's what we are trying to build. With the Southern Grassroots Economies Project, we are actively engaged in, in beginning a reparations loan fund right now. We uh, hopefully our initial activity will be this year, and we are seeking out the support and assistance of other people. We have a working kind of relationship we are developing with the working world, but in fundamentally, we the people in the South are capable of building the Southern Reparations Loan Fund as a Southern institution that will be radically inclusive. And by that I mean making available to people who banks would never dream of lending to, who angel investors would never think of making anything available for, making available to them opportunities to be productive so that they can take their ideas of what it would be to meet human needs and elevate the quality of life in their communities and turn those into productive, sustainable enterprises. In, very, in particular, there's another project. I wanted to mention this because it's a challenge to how a lot of people have seen cooperatives. To, to exactly what Jessica has talked about, about in the recent years, people looking at cooperatives as a white thing, has to do with food. We got all these food deserts in communities. Yeah. Many of the communities that have food deserts are African American communities. There are some other, that, and they should do something about their communities too. I'm, I'm not, but right now we got these black communities, the food deserts that corporate grocery stores decided to withdraw from so that they could consolidate their operation in order to maximize their profit. Yes. Well, that's what this is. It's a capitalist system. That's what people do with their capital. They try to maximize their profit, okay? The fact that it leaves a devastated neighborhood that doesn't have access to food doesn't mean anything because people are not going to go without eating, so they're going to drive to wherever the stores are anyway. The fact that you have additional costs just means it's lowering your standard of living. It doesn't change anything for the corporate bottom line because you're still selling food. So what we decided is we're going to build in Greensboro a food co-op. But when we say a food co-op, we say, well, those things are expensive, and they're about you know, just natural and organic food, and the price point is too high. And in fact, a factor for success in building a, according <laughs> to the dominant consultant group that does consultation across this country about building food co-op, they will list explicitly as a factor for success the percentage of white people in your neighborhood. Oh. oh, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're taking them on. <laughs> no, it's the fact that they want to know how many, they list separately 
the number of people that make between fifty and one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. They list separately the number of people who have a college education, and then they list as a separate factor for success the percentage of white people. I mean, I'm going. Well, I mean, is that because of the income? No, you already got income listed. But is that because of the edu no? You already got education level listed. So it's a separate factor for what does that mean? It's like oh, uh, we're not sure. Okay, well y'all need to find out. But in the meantime, we're building this store. We're building this store in Greensboro, North Carolina, in a neighborhood that if you were to do the study and compare it to other neighborhoods would be rejected because it had two it's too black, too poor, and too dumb, according to these consultants that are doing this work. So we have to build a new set of ideas, a new level of expertise, more again with these ideas that are so dangerous and find ways to be radically inclusive and develop community stuff around that. And so we're insisting that the local government pitch in, so we've got the city of Greensboro to pay uh, $250,000 to the opening of the store. We're trying to get Guilford County to do another $200,000, and the tea, tea baggers are fully in control there, so they, they're trying their best not to. Who knows, they might not. If we don't get it from them, we're going to get it from somewhere else. We're going to open this store by early 2016 only because they delayed. Other than that, we'd have had it open even sooner than that.